I've titled today's message, Signs of Decay. Now, I'm not talking about going to the dentist, okay? Not talking about, a, uh, you know, a tooth turning, you know, starting to get discolored and get pained and, oh, I got to have a root canal and I got a cavity and all that stuff. That's not the signs of decay we're talking about. The signs of decay that we're talking about here is that we're going to look at Saul. You know, last week we were in this place where we, you know, we went through a message called Learning to Trust, and we saw uh, Samuel as he gave account of his life, and he he, he spoke to us about all that God has done, and, and all these incredibly powerful things, for sure, for sure, for sure. But the storyline transitions right here. It goes away from talking about Samuel and it moves to talking about Saul. And, and as this picks up, we see Saul from his er, very earliest uh, of years of leading as a king. And then it moves kind of down the road to some of the signs of decay, if you will, with his leadership. And, and really where that spilled out and what it looked like and how it left the people. It left the people defenseless, it left the people uh, unarmed, it left, it left them in a place of vulnerability. And we're gonna see that in this message, as we talk about the signs of decay and the, and, the, and the check marks that we go through this, we're going to find that it is super important for us to be equipped in the works of ministry. We're going to find that it is super important for us to learn what God has given to us, not only in the scriptures, but by way of fellowship and participation and why and all of those things. And so I challenge you once again, um, you know, sharpen up that pencil of yours, get your notepad ready, and let's dive into signs of decay. Um, Verse number one says this, it says, Saul, Saul reigned one year, and when he had reigned two years over Israel, Saul chose for himself 3,000 men of Israel. Uh, 2,000 were with Saul and Michmash. Sounds like mashed potatoes, Michmash. You put a little bit of, well, I better, my mind's going there. Sorry, I gotta keep moving on. (laughs) Well, Saul was in Michmash and in the mountains of Bethel. uh, And 1,000 were with Jonathan in Gebeah of Benjamin. The rest of the people he sent away, every man to his tent. Well, let's just stop right there and let's figure out what's going on here, okay? The storyline, again, it's going all the way back. We're backing up. We know that chronologically that we've already moved to the end of the life of Samuel, the the prophet, priest, uh, you know. Uh, We're already at the end of his life. And so this chapter 13, it circles all the way back around towards maybe, you know, towards the middle or the beginning of of Samuel's reign when Saul was appointed as king. And the storyline says that, hey, his first and his second year, right? Saul reigned one year, and when he'd reigned two years, okay, what did he do? He went and he chose for himself 3,000 men. We remember that from back in chapter 11, that uh, the way that Israel would protect itself is is that they would gather up all the men, all the able-bodied men that were able to fight, Okay, it was somewhere between 300,000 and 330,000. It was like from, from the whole people group of Israel, it was a militia that was put together, okay? And that's how they would defend and protect themselves against some of the other nations. Now, once Saul comes on board, okay, this is the first king of Israel, he's in place, and in his leadership of these first two years, he puts together the very first army. Of that 300 to 330,000 men, he selects out of there 3,000 dudes, okay? So he took the best of the best and he employed them, he put them in the army and that's, that's where we're at here. You have 3,000 guys. Now 2,000 stayed with him and then he sent, you know, like 1,000 over with Jonathan and uh, this is where uh, the basis of where this story picks up. Now verse number three, take a look at this. It says that Jonathan attacked the garrison of the Philistines that was in uh, uh, Geba, and the Philistines heard of it. Then Saul blew the trumpet throughout all the land, saying, let the Hebrews hear, exclamation point. Super emphatic about this. As this story heats up, what happens is Jonathan, who's got a super courageous heart, this is Saul's son, he takes the the thousand uh, army dudes, the thousand troops that are assigned to him, and he says, you know what? I'm sick and tired of these Philistines pushing us around. I'm I'm tired of us of always being at their beck and call and they're harassing us and doing all of these things. And these stinking Philistines, they might be beach bum type of people, but they are super annoying. And he says, come on, boys, we're gonna go get them. Okay, now that's the Jeff Kramer version, but that's, that's really what happened, okay? He, he took a thousand of these guys and he went after them. He says, let's go smash some heads. And, and 
he goes up there and he completely wipes out this particular military base of the Philistines, okay? That's what we're looking at, a military base. Uh, you know, imagine if somebody came through, um, you know, I'm from San Diego, so we used to have the, um, uh, the Miramar, um, I understand it's a marine base now, but it used to be the, the naval station out there. Top Gun was filmed there, okay? Uh, imagine somebody come in and say, hey, we're just gonna decimate this place. Or going down and doing that at Fort Carson or at Buckley or any of these other military uh, installations that are kind of camped around our, our, our state and stuff. And so that's what he did with these guys. So needless to say, he won, but he stirred up a whole lot of stuff. And we get to point number one. Point number one, is ball hog. Now, by a show of hands, let's participate in this. I hope you'll participate in this. Has anybody in this room, in the course of your years of growing up, or even leading now, have you ever been a ball hog? Okay, some of you are honest, and some of you just don't play ball. <laughs> okay, yeah, I mean, I've been a ball hog before. Goodness, you know, there's, there's, you know, you might be good at a particular sport. Um, I, I don't know if the sport of talking, I don't know if that's a real sport, but... I can entertain myself in a room that's nobody in there. You know, I just talk to the mirror or something, you know? But being a ball hog, well, let's find out what a ball hog is. Go in your Bible here to, uh, to the left, second book of your Bible, Exodus chapter 18. Um, it's about 150 pages into your Bible, maybe 100 pages, somewhere in that range. Uh, but Exodus 18 lays out a very powerful picture of a ball hog, and it will even define what a ball hog is when we get here. Exodus chapter 18 and uh, take your eyes all the way down to verse number 13. It says, so it was on the next day that Moses, he sat to judge the people. And the people stood before Moses from morning until evening. So when Moses, his father-in-law, saw all that he did for the people, he said, what is this thing that you are doing for the people? Why do you alone sit and all the people stand before you from morning until evening? And Moses said to his father-in-law, because the people come to me to inquire of God. And when they have a difficulty, they come to me and I judge between one and another. I make known the statutes of God and his laws. So Moses, his father-in-law, he said to him, he says, the thing that you do is not good, okay? So he's saying, listen, don't be a ball hog. By you being a ball hog and taking solo ministry on here, it's not good. Well, who's it not good for? Verse 18, both you and and these people who are with you will surely wear yourselves out. For this is too much for you. You are not able to perform it by yourself. Listen now to my voice. I will give you counsel and God will be with you. Stand before God for the people so that they may bring the difficulties to God. And you shall teach them the statutes and the laws and show them the way in which they must walk and the work they must do. Don't be a ball hog. In the scriptures from Old Testament all the way into the New Testament, you know, we get into the, the pastoral epistles, we get into even just the regular epistles. Uh, I can think of, of uh, um, the epistle of Ephesians, the book of Ephesians, that, that we are told that God has laid out the body in certain ways. And that any type of ministry that is, is functioning, that is going forward, it is not supposed to be organized, arranged, designed around a ball hog. Okay, I, I hope you capture the, the phrase that I'm using here in this. Uh, you know, just, just solo ministry. That's the ball hog idea. And as we look back within our text now here, what was taking place here as Saul, as the new king, a couple years in, you know, he selected of the choices of men to do battle, but yet it was his son that took maybe just a third of those dudes out and, and Jonathan went out, he made the attack, he did it. He kicked some booty, okay? He's the one that did it. But as soon as he got back from that, what did Saul do? In verse number three there, it says that Saul's the guy that blew the trumpet throughout all of the land and, and so that all the Hebrews can hear. And what was he announcing? He was announcing how great of a victory that he got when really it was Jonathan that got the victory. It wasn't him. The text goes on and, and, and notice what it says in verse four. It says, now, all Israel heard it said that Saul had attacked a garrison of the Philistines. Did Saul attack this garrison? Did Saul go to the place and, and whoop up on these guys in this particular military base? No, it was Jonathan and his guys. And so the idea behind this is we start looking at these things of dealing with signs of decay. The first sign of decay is being a ball hog. 
Don't be a ball hog. If you're a ball hog within your family, if you're a ball hog at your work, if you're a ball hog in ministry, if, 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 you know, if you're doing the things, and, and, and I gotta raise my hand, I've done this here. I've been a ball hog in this ministry, you know, you know in, the, in the inception years, if you will, when we were over here at the rec center before we came over here, that I, I, I was a ball hog in that regard. You know, it's like we're trying to get our feet and under us and keep going forward, but how has God designed the body? Okay, if you're in this room, you have a right hand or a right arm, raise your right arm up. Okay, now, now keeping your right arm up, okay? Raise your left arm up. You got two of them. Now watch this, it's gonna be hard. I'm gonna do this. Uh, now try to raise both of your feet off the ground. Watch me. No, I'm kidding, I can't do that. Come on, <laughs> I can't lift my feet off the ground. Okay, but, but you get what I'm saying, right? Okay, there, there's, there's a multiplicity of things, a multifaceted arms and legs and feet and hands and eyes and, 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 and fingers and toes and you know, all of that stuff. And because that is the way that God has laid out the body, it means that everybody is to participate. And when that participation isn't happening, it means we got somebody being a ball hog and we got somebody sitting on the bench. Okay, we get that. Verse 20. Um, actually, I wanted to read you verse 20 back over in Exodus, but uh, uh, I'm gonna just disregard it and just keep, well, no, I'm not gonna disregard it. You stay where you're at. I'll get to there faster maybe. Um, in Exodus 18 and 20, uh, I, I wanted to make sure that I, I drilled down on this for the purpose. Um, the purpose is nothing more than this, is that as it pertains to ministry, as it, as it pertains to the church, that, that God has arraigned the church and he's put in place the things that he has and the teaching ministry is so vitally important to our comprehension of growing in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Because if I'm going through the scriptures and I'm reading the scriptures and I've got no idea what they mean, I have no idea, you know, what the, you know, how does this all connect to the big picture? You know, I don't even understand what I'm reading here, you know? If we don't know that, then we totally get lost going through the scriptures. And when I read the scriptures, I fall asleep because I don't know what's up. And it's, it's like no fault of your own, if you will. Listen, we all get bored. We totally get bored on things. I get bored. It don't take very long for me to get bored. I, I get bored pretty fast, okay? But... The, the, the certainty of what God has laid out is, is so that the body of Christ would be equipped. And in, in this particular case in Exodus, Exodus was showing Moses leading the people out of Egypt and he stood in this place where he was responsible to teach the people the right way to go. Not only to teach them where to go, to explain, but also to model the way in which to live life, the way to do it. And what verse 20 takes us through over there is, is he gets it all to all, you know, through the teaching and all that stuff. He brings it all the way down and the emphasis becomes is that Moses, yeah, you gotta teach them, but they must understand that this is the way that they must walk and the work that they must do. Not as a law. It's not about a law. He's saying that, that this is part and parcel. Listen, this, this is a wax candle, but it's not a real candle in the sense that there's not a real flame there. Okay, this is a battery-powered thing. What's the job of this candle? To give light, right? If we turn off the lights, the job of the candle is to give, that's why we put a battery in it, turn it on, it looks cool, there's a light within there. And uh, it's a little smelly too, actually. I don't know how they do that. But if you don't know what the scripture has said and what God has given to you personally and you don't know the way in which you're to live out this Christian walk, then all of a sudden you might be a candle, but guess what? Your battery ain't functioning and there you sit. You look good. You know, a little wrinkled around the rim. But that happens with age. That's okay. But you ain't shining brightly for Jesus. You understand what I'm saying? But, but when all of a sudden, man, you get turned on to what Christ has done for you and what Christ is, 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 you know, what his intention is for you to play in this life and being a part of the body, man, when you get turned on to that and you get dialed into what Jesus has for you personally, all of a sudden, man, the lights go on and it is a whole new world. I gotta tell you, man, I, I lived my early Christian life you know, we didn't know much of anything, but we would always go out to where the Christians were at. You know, that's what we're supposed to do, you know? And we, we just kind of plowed through that. But about 10 years in, I think the lights finally clicked for me, man. It's like, oh, God has called me to do this. One of the wonderful things that I love to do, and it's, it's been since early on in my Christian walk, is to train and to disciple young dudes. 
Now, young dudes is relative when you, you know, as you start approaching 50, okay, that term becomes relative, right? Well, what is young? I'm not sure. Okay, but my point is nothing more than this. I know what God has wired me for. I know that, that, yeah, okay, I'm a pastor teacher. That's part of what God has given to me. But one of the main burning things within me is to make disciples. What does the Bible say about making disciples? Matthew 28, Mark 16, right? This is, this is what Jesus has set. Watch, us. This is why God has brought us and, and, and saved us is so that, listen, we've been forgiven that we would forgive others. We've been saved that we would take the message to others. God puts his Holy Spirit within us and his word within us so that we would shine brightly so that others would take notice. We go through hardships so that we can help others in the time of need and suffering. God has done all of that stuff. It's so real, it's so raw, it's so radical, and yet it's so easy. And when I get turned on to what God is up to, all of a sudden, again, my world changes. Well, back here in 1 Samuel, uh, verse number six, uh, I guess I'm getting back on track here. Um, Saul goes and he broadcasts this thing. Hey man, I'm, you know, I took out this, this garrison. Down in verse number six, it says, it says, when the men of Israel saw that they were in danger, for the people were distressed, uh, then the people hid in caves and thickets and rocks and holes and in pits. And some of the Hebrews crossed over the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. As for Saul, he was still in Gilgal and all the people followed him trembling. Okay, he was being a ball hog. We know that. But when his son Jonathan went out and he whooped up on this, this brigade of, of Philistines and took them out, well, the Philistines had a much greater army in place and intact. And, 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 and all of a sudden, the guys that were there they realized that they were inept. They realized that they were in trouble. They realized that, oh no, this battle is fixing to happen and we're fixing to die. And, and that, that, that aspect of the contagiousness of fear, Deuteronomy 20 and verse number eight, Moses addressed that as well. He, he said to the army that he was gathering around him, he says, listen, if any of you are fearful and faint hearted, he says, go home. We don't want you here. If, 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 listen, this is a military thing. And we're going that way for the purposes of, of God. But if you're here and you're fearful and you're faint-hearted, don't come out and lock arms. He says, go home. We got the battle handled. God's with us. It's going to be okay. And that's basically what he said. Well, well, how would that translate out into, you know, the, the, the time of the church that we're in right now? Let's think about that for a second. Hmm. What is some of the greatest inhibitors of God doing a work? Well, it starts with a D. Doubt. Whoever said Doubt. Doubt. Doubt is one of the greatest inhibitors, right? When Jesus walked the face of the earth, you see that he would go to certain areas and certain cities and certain peoples, certain communities and all that stuff. And one of the major, major hindrances where he couldn't do many mighty works, it was because of doubt. It is the same thing. Old Testament, we get the picture of fear that's coming through that. In the New Testament, it's doubt. Well, I doubt God can do this, man. And now it spills over to our Christian life. Well, I doubt that God's with me. Man, I just, I just keep blowing it. I just don't keep, I don't get it right. Well, hey, welcome to humanity. Welcome to being a sinner. Okay, next question. If you have embraced the love of Christ or you've allowed God to embrace you in the love of his son, then guess what? You have been justified. That's done. That's over. That's gone. You're dead to sin. You're alive to God. Now get up, set your eyes on Jesus and start living out the Christian life. Not in an ugly, hostile way, but in, in a way where you do, just don't, you don't keep chewing on your own failure. Now, let me make it easier here for us tonight, okay? Um, if you're in this room, I want to encourage you to participate. It's easy. You don't have to say anything. You just raise a hand, okay? Okay, I, I, I want to get you to participate in this. But I want you to realize that everybody in this room is a failure. So because you're in this room, let's just get it out of the way. Who's a failure? Okay, we got over that, right? We get that. But the next question is, is that, well, does God still love me? Yes, he does. Is God still with me? Yes, he is. Is God still for me? Yes. What are his plans for me? Well, they're for a future and a hope. They're for good. They're not for evil. Oh, do, do you understand that? That simple idea behind that is nothing more than, hey, we might tremble because of our own failure. We might wrestle because of fear of this or doubt over there, but God is good. God's on the throne. God's the one that laid it up. God's the one that saved you. Now get up and get going. Stop crying over spilled milk. Stop. If you like cookies and milk and you spill it everywhere, well, then I'm going to come to your house because I like cookies and milk too. But, but, but don't get all bound up on, you know, trying to live this life of perfection. It's not about a perfect life. It's about, it's about, it's about living a saved life. 
It's about living and understanding who you are in Jesus. In Jesus, I'm free. It doesn't mean I'm free to go and do whatever I want to do. It means that I've, I've been free from the entanglement and the failures of, of what sin perpetuates upon my life. I'm justified in Christ. Um, man, time's flying here. Uh, point number two, uh, lacking spiritual vision. Now, as this story goes on, we move from, uh, again, uh, Saul's early reign to him being a ball hog. That ball hog was is that he's blowing the horn and saying, look at what I did, when really it was his son. But after his son did this, now all of a sudden, you know, Pharaoh lined up, you know, some 30,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen and, you know, people, it says, as, as, uh, as numerous as the sands of the seashore. And now they're coming after Israel, Okay. And the dudes that are with him, we just saw this, there's, they're starting to run. They're starting to get out of there. They're hiding in the cave. Some are going across the other side of the Jordan. It's like, we're out of here, dude. So, so his guys, the number of guys in which he has around him, collectively it was 3,000. And at this point, it's starting to drop down to about 600 people, 600 guys. So it radically fell, okay? Now, this uh, lacking spiritual vision, vision here, Verse number eight, it says, then he waited seven days uh, according to the time is set by Samuel. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal and the people were scattered from him. So Saul said, bring a burnt offering and peace offerings here to me. And he offered the burnt offering. And now it happened as soon as he had finished presenting the burnt offering that Samuel came and Saul went out to meet him that he might greet him. And Samuel said, what have you done? Saul said, when I saw that the people were scattered from me and that you did not come within the days appointed and that the Philistine gathers together at Michmash, then I said, the Philistines will now come down on me at Gilgal and I have not made supplication to the Lord. Therefore, I felt compelled and I offered a burnt offering. And Samuel said to Saul, you have done foolishly. You have not kept the commandments of the Lord, uh, your God, which he commanded you, for now the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. Let's just stop right there, okay? Uh, so, so the picture of all of this is, is nothing more than um, Saul had been given direction as to what to do. Okay, up here at Gilgal, Gilgal was a place that historically, uh, under Joshua, it was a place of, of uh, religious worship. It was one of the very first places that they came to, right? When they crossed over the Jordan, they brought the stones there and all that. They stacked them up at Gilgal. Uh, it was a place of, uh, of politics because they made decisions there. And it was a place where the, the military would gather. That was where Joshua waged war when he took all the different territory in Canaan. And they went out and they, you know, they started destroying all the different people groups and just soaking up all of that land. It was at Gilgal. So the significance of Gilgal, it already had a historical significance. And what the instruction that Saul had was that, listen, you go, you wait there, you stay there in Gilgal, and Samuel, the prophet priest, he would come, he would make the offering, he kind of would bless the army, if you will, and then they would go forward. Well, Saul's a king. Saul's not a prophet. Saul's, Saul's not a priest. What Saul did was that in his lack of spiritual vision, he goes and he's like, okay, I'm dying on the vine here. People are bolting away from me faster than I can even blink my eyes. I went from 3,000, I'm down to about 600 now. And, and this is just incredibly insane. And where's the priest? The dude's nowhere around. He was supposed to be here by now. I'm just gonna do it myself. That's what he did. He stepped over a line that he was never intended to cross. Now think about this. Think about this in our lives for just a second. Because while he was to wait, because the priest represented God doing something, you and I, one of the hardest things perhaps to our Christian walk is to wait on God, is to wait for God to do something. You know, listen, it's hard for me to sit on my hands. It is, it's, it's hard when I drink coffee, it's super hard. When I don't drink coffee, it's still difficult, okay, to, to wait upon the Lord. And I want to teach us three little things, or maybe, not teach us, maybe remind us about three little things about waiting on God. So I want us to do a little bit of Bible Olympics here. Uh, let's go to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 40. Uh, in Isaiah chapter 40, this is a super popular section of Scripture. But in this section of Scripture, Isaiah 40, verse 29 that, that we're going to find in this the, you know, some encouragement about waiting. Here's what it says. I'll pick up again Isaiah 40, verse 29. It's about 
900, maybe 1,000 pages into your Bible. Sounds like everybody's close to it. He says this, I'll read ahead. It's more important that you hear rather than see. He says, uh, he gives power, speaking of, of uh, Isaiah writes, talking about God, it says, God, he gives power to the weak. Well, who are the weak? Well, sometimes that's me. Sometimes it's you. It, it, the, the weak are people, it speaks about somebody that is fatigued. Man, I can go through my life and I can get super fatigued on things. And, and what does God do for the weak person? He says that he gives them power. Literally, this is what it means in the Hebrew. It means that, that it's God giving power, supernatural strength to, like our, to us as, as people. Not to pick up a car, but to keep going in spite of the fatigue. That's it, that you don't stop, that you don't stop moving forward, that you don't give up on God and you leave God. That there's a strength in spite of your circumstances that God gives to you. So he gives power to the weak and to those who have no might. Uh, again, we're, we're dealing with physical strength here. What does he do? He increases the strength. He brings a super exceeding abundance. You and I know that from the, the gospel sense of the gospel of John, John chapter seven, of what Jesus spoke about, that the Holy Spirit would be like torrents of water pouring out of us, that there's a supernatural empowering and a strength that we get by the Holy Spirit to keep going even in the middle of trouble and persecutions and problems and external things, all of these things that can wipe the, the average person out. As a Christian, God has provided that strength for us to keep going. He says in verse 30, he says, even the youth shall faint and be weary and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord, there it is, wait. And we're talking about waiting. Waiting, Saul needed to wait for Samuel to get there. You and I, we wait upon the Lord. What does wait mean? Well, it means to look for. It means to hope. It means to expect that we, those who wait, those who look for hope and expect the Lord to do something, what's gonna happen? We shall renew, the Lord shall renew their strength. Um, and, and they shall mount up with wings like eagles, they shall run and not be weary, they shall walk and not faint. Uh, the, the idea is, is that in the manner of our life, even though there might be toil, even though there might be labor, even though there might be difficulty, is that we don't give up on God and we don't go back. We keep going. Because God has promised to complete what he started. Now, the second thing about waiting, not only is it, is it this here that we look for, we hope, and we expect. Second thing is this. Turn to your left to the book of Psalms. Um, Psalm 130. Psalm 130, verse uh, 5, says this. It says, I, uh, this is Psalm of David. He says, I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I do hope. Now, while Isaiah talks about the physical strength, over here with this particular psalm, dealing with this waiting aspect still, David goes and he, did, he mentions the soul. What is the soul? The soul has to do with our, our mind, our emotion, our will, all of those internal things, okay? The other side that, again, that we dealt with, that he dealt with in Isaiah 40, that was dealing with the strength and the stamina, okay? With, to somebody that's fatigued and weary to keep going, physically to keep going. On this side, waiting for, the low, waiting for the Lord or waiting upon the Lord, as we stay within his word, the thing that takes place is that there's encouragement that is brought to the mind, to the emotion, and to the will. There's a staying power that, that, that God does supernaturally through his word, as we read his word, as we're encouraged in his word, as the way that we think is transformed, all of that stuff happens merely by getting into God's word. Now, I don't know how long each of you have been a Christian in here, but I'll tell you this, it doesn't take very long on walking with the Lord to know that, man, when I wait upon God, because it's like my circumstances, it's rough. I need, I need a good word from God today. I just feel like a cranky bear. And I open up that word, and, and, and it's like, I don't know how God does it. But all of a sudden, it's like, dude, that's, I needed to hear that. What's right on this page, I needed to hear that. That is an example of waiting. And, and, and as we look into God's word, God's word encourages us, our mind, our emotions and our will are shaped by his word. Now, the third thing is this. In Psalm 27, um, you're, if, you're, if you're there, if you're following along, great. If you're not, if, if you've nodded off because it's 1,000 degrees in here, uh, that's for Justin, by the way. Um, I'm with you. Um, yeah, you can turn it down a little. 
Psalm 27, verse 13 and 14, it says this. He says, I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Verse 14, wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Man, if you, if, if, if you need to hold on to a particular verse about the faithfulness of God, man, here's one of those verses. Here's, here's one of those verses, man, that, that, that listen, God makes sure that all of us go through these seasons and these stretches here to where it's like, dude, I am just about ready to give up on Jesus. And the encouragement that we have from his word is that we don't give up on Jesus, that we wait on the Lord, that we understand that we are to look for, that's what we're to do, we're to hope, yeah, that's what we're to do, we're to expect, yeah, we're to to do that. That, that, that as we hang on to that expectation of God being faithful, of us being able to trust God and all of that, that we're going to to generate new strength and there's going to be a courage and a staying power that God provides to us. That's the whole idea of waiting. And what Saul should have done in this situation as a leader, instead of having this aspect of this tarnished leadership with these signs of decay that we talked about, that, that he should have been in this particular place to know well enough, even as the anointed king over Israel even after all that was given to him by the prophet Samuel, that he was to give those encouraging words to the people so that they would not give up in the face of adversity. Now we turn it back around here to Wednesday night, 2019 here, and here I stand as your pastor. That, that part of my responsibility is, is, is we, as we dive into the Old Testament scriptures is to stir up your pure, way, your pure mind by way of reminder, always bringing you back to the simple truths of what God has spoken to you. Why? So that the emotions of your heart won't get um, wobbly and give up. So the thoughts in your brain that when you're tempted to be pulled aside into this temptation or that temptation, that you're brought back to a place of going, wait a minute, God doesn't want me in that. If I endure temptation, the scripture tells me that the person that endures temptation, that he's going to get the crown of life. All of these pieces come together here. And, and, and then when I come into church here and you know, I lift my hands during worship or I have somebody pray for me or whatever, I walk out of the door, even though it's been a long day, I walk out of the door having been in the presence of God. Scripture says that it, it's in the presence of the Lord that times of refreshing come, that I'm refreshed, that I'm encouraged. And even though it might have been a long, rough day and I'm tired and I'm hungry, that there's something special that takes place that's supernaturally that can't be duplicated online. They can't be duplicated by not getting together in, 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 a, in a fellowship of believers. It's something unique. It's something that God does right there in the moment. It's not like a video that I purchase and I watch. It's something different. And all of that comes from waiting on the Lord. And all of that was what... Um, Saul should have done. He shouldn't have taken the matters into his own hands. He should have encouraged the people to continue to go on. Well, I'm virtually out of time and we have so much more to talk about here. So what shall we wrap this up with? Um, I'm just gonna advance down to point number three here and see if I can do a, a high level on this. Point number three is defenseless. In verses 15 down through the end of the chapter, um, it says that 1 Samuel 15, or 1 Samuel 13, verse 15, it says Samuel, Samuel arose and he went out from Gilgal to Gebeah of Benjamin. And Saul numbered the people that were with him, about 600 men. So there's the fall. It went from 3,000 to 600. And verse 17 and uh, 18 tells us that the Philistines, they lined up in uh, Ophrah, which is in the north. Verse 18, Ben-Horan, which is in the west. Zimboing, which is in the east. And then the last verse, verse 23, um, this is Michmash. Um, this is something that faced towards Gebeah. The idea is moving to the south. So if we look at this, all points of the compass, it's not looking good for them, okay? That's the whole idea. And as it moves through these final verses here, it talks about them getting ready to square off with these guys, but they did not have any uh, weapons of warfare. Verse 22, look at that one. It says, and so it came to pass, or it came, it came about on the day of battle that there was neither sword nor spear found in the, 
the hand of any of the people who were with Saul and Jonathan. <laughs> okay, you're going to battle against some people that want to take you out because you whooped up on them. And now, in the middle of this battle, not only has your troop depleted from uh, 3,000 to 600, okay? So, you know, you're, you're less than a third of what you started out with. Uh, your leader has weak knees. The dude is stinking selfish because he likes to toot his own horn. He likes to be a ball hog. And he likes to, you know, he likes to toot his own horn. And not only that, you're left entirely defenseless because he's not equipped or prepared you. Oh my goodness, you got everything on your side. Mm -hmm. Not looking too good for you. Listen, what I do as a pastor is to equip the saints for the work of ministry. Ephesians chapter four, verse number 12, it tells that. There's a very specific work for pastors to do. What we're doing even at a greater level within this fellowship in this particular season, we're running through foundation classes, we're running through doctrine classes, we're running through servant classes. We're, we're, we're taking the nuts and the bolts here of sitting in a, a gigantic classroom setting with, with a dialogue, not a monologue, but a dialogue, a back and forth of equipping saints for the work of ministry. Building people up in Jesus so that they can have the answers to the big questions and the small questions and they can be encouraged to live for Christ. That, that's very simple. That's all, uh, that's all that it is. But Saul and his leadership as the king, he did not equip or prepare the guys that were under them. And thus, when it came to that time of battle, they were completely left vulnerable, exposed, and without any weapons. Let's close with this. Turn in your Bible to the book of Ephesians chapter six. Ephesians chapter six, it tells us this. In verse number 10, he says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Uh, the, the tricks of the devil is all that that means. And he goes on and he says that, listen, th this battle is not against flesh and blood. Against principalities and powers and a whole host of wickedness in the heavenly places. And he lays all that out. Paul would also tell us in Corinthians that the weapons of our warfare, that they're not of the natural, they're not of the carnal, they're not of, uh, you know, they're, they're not of spears and swords and all of that stuff, but they're supernatural. That we understand because of what God has given to us within his word that Satan is desiring to trip us up and to trick us on so many fronts within our life. And it can even be in that area of self-deception because fall, uh, Saul fell to that place where, where he acted foolishly, that he was lacking the spiritual and the moral insight as to how he was to be leading the nation. And he took different matters into his own hands. And we as God's people, there should never be a time when we're left alone. There should never be a time when we're not in a place to where we're being taught the scriptures. There should never be a time when we're not stirred up and having the, uh, being reminded of the grace of God. There should never be a time when we're not helped in the practicalities. There should never be a time when we're not held accountable through the aspect of fellowship with other believers. And if any one of those particular things are, are, are lacking, then we end up as a people that we have a form of godliness but there's no real power that is involved in it. And thus, the perpetual struggle to try to live the Christian life. It's not filled with joy. It's, it, it's filled with laws and frustrations and trying to do better and trying to do all this self-reformation. And we've completely missed what God has granted to us in Jesus Christ by way of justification and his wonderful, wonderful empowerment of his Holy Spirit and his great love to walk us through sanctification, which is a lifelong process of us being under construction and learning who Jesus is and how much he loves us. Thanks for joining us today. If you want to know more about having a real relationship with God, click the Do You Know Him link at westminstercalvary.org. We invite you to join us for our regular worship services on Sundays at 9.30 a.m. and Wednesdays at 6.30 p.m. We are conveniently located on the northeast corner of Wadsworth Parkway and Church Ranch Boulevard in the Stanley Lake Marketplace Shopping Center. For more information, please contact our church offices at 303-223-4640. Thanks and God bless.